see as we as as people are are joining in, um, I will just remind everybody that uh, this this session is called "All Companies Are Technology Firms Today," and we'll maybe wait a few seconds. Uh, we're also waiting for Sanjay, one of our panelists, to join us. So as soon as we have uh, a few more people joining, we'll we'll get started. Okay, I think I think we should, uh, Michael and Mark. I think we should get started, and and Sanjay can can catch up. Uh, he might be, you know, very in, engrossed in another session. Yeah. So we'll, we'll add him in when he when he joins. Uh, so I, I wanted to, you know, kickstart here, which was very interesting when we were chatting uh, last week, when we were preparing for the session, uh, which of course, as I just said, is all companies are technology firms today. Uh, we, we almost in unison all responded uh, that in fact, which organizations today are not technology companies. Um, and of course, we all asked ourselves that question and, and uh, none, and but we'll we'll get back to that. Uh, but before we we get started, I want to make sure we we introduced ourselves quickly. And I will I will get started. Um, I'm Brendan Denable. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Dynamico. We are a business systems technology implementer and an integrator. And of course, in my short you know 53 years, I've seen some uh, evolution in technology, including from where I was, I, I was, I'm originally from Namibia, grew up in the, the fishing and shipping port of Walpus Bay, where my, where my father worked. And I, in my younger years, I saw the evolution of uh, shipping going from manually loading ships to containerization. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of great stories about how containerization uh, as, a, as a technology, as a platform has changed the way the world works. Um, of course, today we're going to be digging into into more details. Anyhow, so that's me, Brendan Denable. I'm based in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, and I would now like to uh, hand you over to Michael. Michael, please introduce yourself. Well, thank you, Brendan. It's a pleasure to to be here, and it's been fantastic to get the opportunity to speak with you in the prep sessions as well. Both of you, I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, so I started uh, my journey in a subset of the tech space, which is AI are commonly known as uh, AI and uh, analytics. And um, uh, currently I'm um, on the board of a number of uh, companies, uh, TCG Digital, uh, LoveVantage, which focus on the intersection between biological and AI space. Um, Lumos uh, Digital, which is the intersection of um, uh, oil production, effectively refineries and AI. and um, also, Planet Smart City, which is uh, um, effectively on the future of living and uh, uh, how AI can help develop the neighborhoods and improve quality of life uh, in in um, housing. Uh, before that, I, I worked here in the Valley with um, investment companies um, and uh, most of the time was with uh, the Goldman team out here on the uh, their portfolio companies. I also worked um, as partner for McKinsey for 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 the setup of their global AI practice. It's called now called Digital McKinsey, where we were looking at the digital transformation and the role of AI in that uh, for quite some years. And before that, I was building out a company internationally called SAS Institute, uh, which is also in analytics and AI. So that's uh, basically my background. I've been in the AI subset of technology since uh, 89. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Mark, how about you? Um, I, got, I started my career in the early 80s um, in Silicon Valley, um, working with um, entrepreneurial high-tech companies, first at Bank of America, which at the time was the, the dominant player in this space, in the next several years, worked for a couple other banks, started technology groups there. In the early 90s, um, went to work for Silicon Valley Bank and spent um, 24 years there at Silicon Valley Bank, 
um, doing everything from leading the sales force to credit, opening up our international offices and into the career of chief risk officer, um, which had credit and everything else underneath it, uh, doing it. Retired from Silicon Valley Bank about five years ago. And now I said, I'm chairman of the board of Lighter Capital, which is a fintech company. I sit on the board of Pollen, which is another fintech company. I sit on the board of Customer Vineyards, which is a company trying to bring big data to the wine industry. Um, and sit on the board of Avid Bank, uh, which is a bank based in, in Silicon Valley. And then I'm on the advisory um, of a couple entities. And then also a trustee for my undergrad um, endowment. Um, so a lot of experience in the Valley and seen a lot of transformation over the last 40 years. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. It, it, it just, it sounds, you know, when you go from, from banking and, and agriculture to, to the things we're talking about today, that there's a lot, there's a lot of, a lot of history and a lot to talk about. Uh, Sanjay, thanks. Thanks so much for, for being here. Uh, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Brendan. Uh, this is uh, Sanjay Jupri. I'm the founder and president of a digital services company called Quintelli. Uh, we are a, what we call a six-year-old startup uh, with over 900 people raising to 1,000 now. Uh, I bootstrapped this company six years back um, with the sole intention of helping uh, enterprises, small, big, medium, and startups in in moving them from the, the pre-digital uh, era to digital era. Uh, we work on, on a lot of digital transformation projects, uh, automation, DevOps, customer experience, and things like that. We have clients, you know, across the spectrum from the from the largest pizza company in the world to to largest airlines to large banks, uh, and and also helping companies that traditionally have been brick and mortar use uh, IT for you know back office stuff to digitizing them and making. Uh, uh, digital as their first offering, converting you know old school companies to tech and stuff like that. Uh, very honored to be here uh, with y'all, uh, and, and excited for this panel, Brendan. Excellent. Yeah. Th yeah. Thanks to, to all three of you. And I'm I'm hoping that we'll get a chance to sort of connect some of the dots, but we we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna dive straight in. So as I was saying at, at the introduction. You know, when we when when the, when the four of us met, the we talked about the topic, of course, and and instead of saying, you know, all companies are technology firms today, we we all kind of said, which organizations today, in fact, are not technology companies, and of course, uh, between the four of us, we we really struggled uh, to come up with some some answers. But I'm gonna I'm gonna let each of you, you know, speak to that. So, you know, Michael, Mark, Sanjay, do can any of you think of any businesses today that are not using technology that or, or that should not be considered them consider themselves as tech firms? <laughs> not not really, but if if helpful I can uh kick off that discussion a little bit with uh, just the screen, a survey we did at, uh, at uh, McKinsey. I don't know if, um, if, um, if it would be visible, but I can try to share it, see if it works. Oh, I'm well, you share it. Instead, can mm -hmm. you see it or maybe not? It doesn't work. Yeah, it's, it's, it's showing up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's time to show up. You see these uh, different maturity levels of digital adoption. No, we're we're just we're currently just seeing your desktop. Oh, are you seeing yeah. a mess of stuff? Okay, so it doesn't yeah. it doesn't work. Then I don't know quite how to do it. But basically, okay. the the what it showed was we had the travel industry where the adoption was the highest, and then it went retail, telecom, uh, banking, financial insurance, and the whole way back to energy. Uh, materials and agriculture and uh, the question we had was why is this a, uh, and the, the adoption was invented use cases that exist today uh, to what degree are they adopted in the, in the context of AI and, and digital transformation and the question was why are certain industry lagging behind other industries and um, you know I think when it comes to the B2C and the marketing we have gotten used to interact with 
with bots. But what we are starting now to see is that um, you know industries that perhaps were a little bit more conservative, uh, like farming or energy or or um, uh, agriculture, they are starting to pick up now as well. And, and uh, you know, in our session earlier, uh, I know Mark had a fabulous example example of that. So even the companies that used to be lagging a bit are are picking up. So I think the companies that we would have thought of as non-digital are now suddenly becoming digital as well. So. Absolutely. So adding to that, Brendan, I uh, even I had a tough time thinking of which companies are not <laughs> needing to be uh, you know, digitally transformed. You know, from a, a hole-in-the-wall restaurant to, to large enterprises, everyone is moving towards digital. Some of them are inherently, they are building their own apps and things like that. Others are just using uh, really powerful SaaS-based mobile applications to become digital. So, you know, you have housewives in India delivering food from their kitchen with a with a, with an app, right? Uh, can they develop their own software? No, but they can use uh, softwares that are developed by people, you know, in all across the the country and the world uh, to become to becoming digital. So that's where the biggest push is coming. Either you are doing on your own as as a company or an enterprise, or if you can't, you're relying on someone who can provide that as a service. So it is. I mean, it, it is inevitable that all of us will be in a digital age very soon. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think the example that I pointed out earlier. Um, and a pre-discussion was I was watching CNBC uh, this morning and they were, had John Deere in the stock chart up there and the John Deere was doing well. And they specifically talked about a new tractor implement John Deere's putting out that's using AI to um, make sure fertilizer is efficiently distributed. And they said they could, they expected to reduce fertilizer usage by 80% given this. And then the commentator added that John Deere has been spending heavily and she just said on tech, tech, tech. And the market seems to be rewarding John Deere for that um, push. But but you can see how, again, AI and again, I grew up on a farm. There was no AI. <laughs> there, was, there was a gut feel and uh, AI never or technology really didn't, other than tractors and mechanical right. harvesting, didn't really come in. So you can see the changes that have occurred. And yeah, which, yeah, time. absolutely. And which, of course, is the full circle to where Michael started, where he was saying that, you know, ag and, and farming were really in, you know, amongst the laggards um, whenever whenever McKinsey did that initial study. And so if they're if they're adopting technology and AI, then you know you'd you'd have to think that pretty much everyone else is too, right? So I've figured it out in the meantime, I think. You should be seeing it now. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the the hundred these were based on existing use cases. So the potential was a hundred. Existing use cases were uh, for half of the potential say and that was adopted in say B2C and personalized marketing. Uh, but in the agriculture sector, the invented use cases are not fully adopted uh, and there were uh, big room for improvement and adoption. And that's what you see starting to see now. And I, I heard a similar story from Caterpillar where they moved from selling machines to selling earth movement, yeah. uh, which obviously is a you know, similar type of transition. Absolutely. That's, that's great. I think that's a great, a great place to, uh, to kick us off. So, and, and, you know, the term, you know, of course, a lot of us, you know, consider ourselves to be working in the digital transformation space, which again, you know, according to McKinsey, um, you know, we're, we're probably all familiar with the, 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 certain, the research that they've done over the last few years that, you know, whatever the number is, $4 trillion in the next three years um, in the digital transformation space, which, uh, again, we all have a slightly different understanding of what that really means. But so I'd like to hear from, from the three of you, you know, how, how do you uh, think about or define digital transformation uh, of, of an organization? Because I think everybody has a slightly different understanding of what digital transformation really means. Michael, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, so sure, I'm happy to. I think 
there are different horizons to it the way I experience it. The first one usually is that at least if you are in the laggard sense, uh, you start to think of a digital twin because you want to collect the data from sensors. And if your problem is that you have too many databases, you create another one, you call it a data lake or something else to have it all integrated. Uh, so that's sort of still an analog business process. Um, but then in phase two, we get more and more in you know, horizon two into use cases. For example, predictive asset management or predictive maintenance in those type of use cases or yield optimizations in the cases shared earlier. And those use cases typically mean that it's more of a real-time integration and IoT drew a lot of that uh, capability and ability to do that. And, uh, mm-hmm. But you, the decision-making is often still augmented. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the third horizon, when the decision-making is also done by the AI bots, then typically the infrastructure is designed uh, natively digital. Um, and, you know, if, if, for example, it's a refinery, then they are not just thinking of the flow of the carbon anymore. They're also thinking about the flow of the data and the data becomes part of the architecture. Uh, that's less, you know, common in 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 the uh, sort of laggard industries than the leading industries, but it's starting to happen more and more. And you see that real time go over to some process being fully automated, like for example, the shutdown of a plant that was incomprehensible that the AI bot would decide to sh- shut down a refinery. Uh, but it's proven that uh, humans, they hesitate to make that decision too long uh, with fatal consequences. So that's one of the examples of a use case where it's kind of gone the whole way. Mm, thank you. Mark? Um, well, that's elegant, you know, putting out the overall um, th- uh, framework of it. Um, you know, I would say one of the things I look for is is the company using flat files or robust files for their data? You know, you know, are they are they pushing stuff into the Excel spreadsheets, whatever, or is it organic in the process that they're doing it? Um, and how are they organized? Um, I'll just tell a war story. It's going back about six years in banking when I was still at Silicon Valley Bank. Um, I had a, I got all of the. Um, Bank Secrecy Act, any money laundering, whatever, it all came underneath me. And um, so I had to look at it and I saw there's reports being developed. And essentially they all had like null signals for months and months and months. And I'm going, what kind of data is this? And the people doing it couldn't explain to me what what these signals were supposed to tell them. And, and then so I did more digging and how banks were organizing themselves, et cetera. And I realized that what happens is you had a bunch of people used to doing it a manual way. And then you have the tech guys coming in and giving them a tech solution, but there was no bridge between the two. And so I advocated to say, we need to pair not only technology in the IT department, but the actual group using the technology need to have IT capability themselves. Yeah. Somebody that could bridge that gap to tell them what was going on. So I look at organizational structures. If they still have just IT over here, all the business over in another place, um, I think they're going to be challenged to to do a digital transformation in a uh, effective way. Great, thanks, Mark. Sanjay, how about you? Um, so, in my view, there are you know two ways for companies to become you know to to transform themselves digitally. Uh, one is to redefine their entire business model and power and power it by digital, right? So, so one of the classic examples we have seen a, a customer of ours is uh, uh, Domino's Pizza. So they call themselves a technology company that also delivers pizza, right? Uh, and every aspect of 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 making it, ordering a pizza, delivering a pizza, making a pizza is powered by uh, powered by digital, right? So it's a traditional, you know, you, you can't have more traditional business model than making pizzas, right? So, but they have innovated and said, you can order a pizza to your local store by sending a pizza emoji, right? Just send a pizza emoji uh, in, in 30 minutes later, 
you'll get a pizza delivered to your doorstep, right? Uh, so that's taking your existing uh, business model and powering it by digital all the way through. That's the ultimate digital transformation, right? That you can use AI, you can use anything that you want, but at the end of the day, you're transforming your business model and powering it with the, uh, or, or leading it with dig- digital, right? The other uh, thing is a lot of companies uh, have already existing softwares that they have developed. Um, what people are doing is they have, you know, they're also calling themselves, you know, transforming digitally because they have done it in an old legacy, you know, old style of delivering software. They're moving to agile and they're saying we will, we will use, you know, AI, big data, machine learning, what have you of already built. Uh, our companies are already built using software, but we are now elevating it to the next level. That's another phase of digital transformation companies are are going through, and it's uh, you know it's bo- both of both of them are good, but the ultimate goal is to enable all your business through digital. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you all. That's the, yeah. So we we touched on on various things there. Um, you know, again, there's there's the technology component, there's the the, the data component. Uh, there's, of course, redefining your your processes, um, and then of course, you know, realigning the the people in each organization to do what, what all three of you were just were just talking about. Um, in fact, I heard I heard a, another statistic recently, and I I don't know where exactly this comes from, but you know, maybe you can agree or disagree with this um, statistic that uh, 90% of leadership is decision making so if 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 to be a, the leader of a of a of a growing successful company um, you know what do you need uh, to make better faster decisions and again you know every, all 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 roads point to what we've just talked about where you know, you have to have the data um, that you require to make the best decisions, uh, the fastest decisions that you can to remain competitive in whatever industry you're, you're in. Um, but anyway, I just, I just, that just came to mind as, as I was kind of tying the thread between what the three of you were, were saying. Um, so the, the, the bottom line, of course, is that we're, we're just the, we're in an increasingly digital world. Uh, the only thing that's that's changing when you think about it from one perspective is is the velocity of of the adoption um, and how much technology we will have to deal with. Um, and it is also that you know we ha- how we interact with our employees is becoming not is as as critical now as ever. So that so my next question uh, for the three of you is how do you think? Um, technology is impacting our our workforces and what do employers and managers need to navigate uh, and figure out with regards to setting up technology for their employees to do better work Sanjay do you want to would you like to start on on this one Sanjay yeah you need to just you're you're still muted I'm sorry Uh, okay Uh, thanks Brendan uh, for reminding me. Uh, so there's going to be an increased uh, level of, um, you know, digital in every aspect of our, uh, you know, of our workforce, uh, whether we, you know, whether we like it or not, we'll see routine mundane tasks that our employees are doing at every level, uh, automated using the, you know, advanced uh, RPA, uh, robotic process automation kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, processes and methodologies, right? Uh, in the coming uh, years, we would see 80% of what we are doing is automated using a bot, more than 80%, right? And and what we have to train our uh, people is not to worry about the 80%, uh, but take care of the, use the 20, 20 to 30% of the time that we uh, are, are freeing up from, from automating the rest to address the creative aspects of our uh, of our. Uh, Every day, you know, uh, life. Um, so, you know, a, a classic example is, you know, very soon when we miss a when there's a big weather event uh, and all the flights are are cancelled, right? So, as of now, the two ways people go rebook their flights: one, who are at the airport, go stand in the line; the other, uh, get on a on a call. And some people like me do the do both, right? I'm on a call and I'm standing on the line. So, whoever comes first, <laughs> I'll go and do it, right? Uh, but, but we are, you know, helping airline companies that can do 
auto rebooking of all the flights so you don't need those call center folks to to manually go and search for the flights everything everything will now be be automated so there'll still be exceptional cases where people are needing something new uh, they say oh i don't want to go to this destination i probably you know i have my bags packed to go to a beach because i don't really need to go there why don't you book me there right so people are going to address those versus trying to rebook every flight and every passenger right so that's where digital comes into picture that's where automation comes into picture and we need to train our employees not to worry that oh computer is not going to replace your job we still need those call centers we can we cannot achieve 100% Uh, automation anywhere right so so that's uh, i think it's in our hands to to ensure that people are uh, understanding this and and working towards that creative part the human part uh, versus worrying about what the bot can take over that's my take on that mm-hmm. great thanks sanjay mark what about you what is your take on this one um probably uh, my take from the cultural side and looking at the companies i you know i work with uh the pandemic really um changed the paradigm pretty aggressively and so i had on the board you know four companies on the boards of three of them were already relatively remote so it didn't affect them all that much but one which was the bank uh was not remote at all or pretty much not at all and so for them they were able to get technology moved off and now we've got whether it's zoom we've got all these these ways of being able to have employees work from home the issue is is how do you keep a cultural connection between the person their colleagues the organization and that's one particularly the bank is is struggling with is how do i you know do that or in these zoom meetings you know the leaning over your cubicle talking to somebody when you have a question or wandering into your manager's office those things just don't happen as spontaneously so uh, i think there needs to be some rethink for a lot of companies as to how do i keep my the connective tissue um between the employees and the company and also the culture how do i keep the culture moving in the direction i want to um when there's a chance that at least for a chunk of the time people are going to be sitting in their offices bedrooms etc you know working away but not necessarily interacting directly with people and so we're we're still humans right you know and, and so seeing somebody seeing their facial expressions what their tone is whatever in a in a real life situation rather than over a flat screen uh, makes a big difference so the so my issue for companies is the technology side i think is is getting along pretty aggressively and being solved it's the management cultural the soft issues that i think are going to take more work yeah absolutely michael what 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 about you yeah uh, you know i i would agree it's with, with the culture uh, as to focus um i um you know when we did uh, one of the surveys uh, around digital transformation um we probably interviewed 100 leadership teams i don't know that we got the same definition twice of what they thought digital transformation was yeah. uh, but every company put a lot of money into it um you know some companies would talk about improved decision making as an outcome others would talk about the fact that they are now going to be able to wrap their product in a new service layer which would move them up the value chain um and and uh, improve their impact for customers but i think that common theme around velocity to impact was always there everyone hoped that um impact output would improve uh, as a as a result of the digital transformation but the adoption was always the key Uh, and specifically if we look at areas like ai companies are always very successful in doing a pilot but then that pilot is to be rolled out to production and then usually then it's not designed <laughs> uh, to be maintained in production and data flows are you know living 
uh, or almost organically living in an organization, and so are you know the development and the learning of the models. And if that's not taken into consideration, then the maintenance of these become very difficult. And it's not a technology play anymore. It's a culture play. It's the way we work. It's man machine integration. It's retooling, reskilling. It's so many topics that needs to be put in together with that uh, next level of uh, digital transformation for that to happen. So to bring all that together, at least in my experience, I think the focus on a concrete use case has been the way to do that one step at a time and um, hand to hand. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, and, and clearly the fact that, that it's still such a uh, talked about topic you know, in in the media daily, and any if if you if you're chatting with anyone in the, in the business space or who's an who's an employee, it's just it's an ongoing you know conversation. And of course, one one of one of the things that we hear all the time is that this. So we, for example, are, are on a hybrid work situation, which has again become you know very very popular. Um, but and then you have companies who've gone completely remote um, and say they will never return to an office again. And then of course you have those who think that they can still get people back to an office, you know, 75, 80, maybe even a hundred percent of the time. And of course some, you know, hands-on workers need to go back uh, to work. But the, 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 the point though, is that no one has really figured it out yet. Um, and of course it depends on, you know, from one business type to the next. And most of the decisions that have been made so far um, have been made with very little data, and are you know most likely to to change what they've decided at least for now, uh, which is of course everyone's you know prerogative. But it'll be interesting to see how, how it unfolds. Uh, but you know the employee uh, communication you know aspect of this is of course a critical one, and I think you you all touched on that. So we've already mentioned, I haven't been counting exactly, but we've already mentioned AI uh, a number of times just in the, in the first half hour here. And we've, of course, everyone has seen multiple statements made by all kinds of people and futurists and even ourselves um, around, you know, AI and, and machine learning. Um, and that it's, you know, could be the, the greatest invention since since the invention of fire which when most people hear that for the first time it's it's quite a it makes you makes you stop and think um so in in your opinion and i'll mix it up again the, the order again here uh what what in your opinion uh, is the role of artificial intelligence in in the larger technology landscape that we're discussing and how at all do we separate AI from from all other technology. Mark, do you want to take this one first? Um, yeah. It well, and, and I realize there's different layers to what people call AI too. Uh, sometimes you know, like machine learning is it pattern recognition? Is it something deeper than that? Um, clearly, in the companies I'm working with, one trying to bring big data to the wine industry it's mining a lot of data and, and trying to evaluate it in an efficient way to target customers. Um, so to me, it's not, it's not the high level AI. It's probably more pattern recognition. Um, and then in the, um, uh, the FinTech area, again, it's trying to, Again, look for pattern recognition and typically assist the human in making decisions. The problem with humans is you all have biases. And so is there a way to present information as much as possible without bias and then have, if, if humans need to make a decision, they make a decision off that. And um, um, so that is, and I think both of those are, very critical value, valuable ads to the industry. Um, and you're already seeing some companies, certainly on the fintech side, be very aggressive about, you know, about putting that information and actually maybe not even having human interaction at all in the decision-making. 
And then on the wine side, they may be delayed, but it was Procter and Gamble. There was, I remember this must have been six, seven years ago, you know, six years ago, I was in Israel talking to a company working for a large consumer goods company. And they were talking about they had gotten very good at tracking people's behaviors. In fact, maybe a little bit too good because they were, they had an example where the company would send out, um, and this is still, you know, by mail, but they send out coupons or whatever. And all of a sudden this household, husband, wife, two children, probably teenagers, and they started to get um, um, diapers, pampers, things like that. And the, the husband and wife go, what are we getting these things for? We didn't do it. Well, what it was was their daughter had gotten a pregnancy test, had done some things, and the data shot, you know, baby products to her. So it was probably an uncomfortable way to find that out. So they're trying to calibrate, you know, how aggressive they do that. But clearly, these companies have been spending time and money um, doing uh, doing that. Right. Which, um, Sanjay, I'll, I'll, this, this kind of comes back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, the 80% and the 20%, you know, what Mark was saying now is that, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're assisting the humans um, to make better decisions using technology. So uh, anyway, but why, why don't you go next? So, you know, the, there's two things that we, we should look at when we talk about AI, right? One is the applied AI where we know we take artificial intelligence and apply it in, in, in one use case, right? Where we say, okay, we will drive this car like how a driver uh, would drive. And these are all the possibilities of, of what could happen. And you ha- cast a big net and say, okay, let AI catch everything and, and we, will, uh, we will have the driverless car drive as if a human would drive, right? Probably better than a human <laughs> would drive. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think our, uh, our efforts are going well on that uh, aspect of, of, of applied AI. But there comes a generalized AI where you are saying that, you know, I don't know, I'll, I'll create all the ways of thinking uh, for my software. But if there is a new uh, thing that comes in, uh, the AI should understand and react to it. So we are probably a little far from that. Uh, but when we talk about all the other technology, it is no different. Um, I mean, actually, all of that is building blocks for AI. You can't have AI all of a sudden come out from nowhere. So you are building AI on top of existing systems and making it work uh, like how a human would mimic uh, them to make work a very advanced intelligent human uh, uh, would would work right so you would still need you you can't throw away all the other technology as we call it now right um, we can, we have ways to improvise it use them as building blocks to make ai work uh, uh, work really better right but it, there is no uh, there's no looking back you know there's a lot more that would happen in a perfect example of uh, uh, of what we've heard from Mark is when you search for something and the, the AI aspect of it starts sending info, <laughs> whether, whether you intended it or not. And I've seen it in, in a few cases when I was searching something, all of a sudden my YouTube starts uh, uh, showing uh, uh, showing advertisements. I, Luckily, I was searching for, you know, kid-friendly stuff, but imagine you're searching for non-kid-friendly and then it starts showing advertisement, right? Uh, but again, you know, that's where the the, the human aspect should come in and ha- have a little bit more sensitivity uh, in designing uh, uh, AI. But when you, to your question, right, it's difficult to separate the other technology from AI because it's actually we are building on top of uh, a lot of things we have already built on. Mm-hmm. Michael. You have the last say on this one. <laughs> well, I don't think anyone will have the last say on this one. <laughs> yeah, well, for but, today at least. <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't think it's a natural pro- project, project and be, pro- yeah, progress because we, you know, we have through the industrialization pretty much automated a lot of things that were done manually, and that's increased the way we live, you know, improved the way we live, work, and, and uh, engage. And um, this fourth industrial revolution, as is commonly referred to, is no different. But now we're trying to make the machines intelligent and figuring out how we as humans are going to interact with intelligent machines. It will will take us a long time. Um, I I do think, though, that, uh, yeah, so 
overly generalized uh, and that's what AI is all about. But if you look at the subset of that, which is machine learning in the context of realizing AI, then most of the discussions are around really one type of um, machine learning, which is supervised learning. Um, pretty much, you know, the data teaches the machine and, um, you know, the data is a result of how we as humans acted. And if we acted with uh, um, certain, uh, you know, with racism in mind, for example, or other type of, of uh, ways biased. that we were biased, then what you will find is that um, that's stored in the data and then that's what sort of the bot will be trained on. I think the unsupervised learning um, is is discussed a little bit less, uh, but that's the needle in the haystack to 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 find a hidden connections, a little bit the Rain Man type <laughs> discussion, and and um, then you have reinforced learning, which is really the trial and error, um, which if you ever go and um, do gambling, for example, you would get you would you'd meet those kind of bots on the other side. Uh, mm -hmm. And deep learning, which effectively is the output of one type becomes the input of the next, and there are seven plus layers to that, which we use for image recognition and voice recognition, face recognition, all sorts of things like that. Uh, but combined, these are very different types of of, um, of of AI technologies and what we machine learning technologies, and what we often find is that. Um, you know, we train uh, AI specialists on one of the four families, and then no matter the question, that one family becomes the answer. And, and um, we don't do that when it comes to the industrialization at large, because then we know there is a difference between a, a plumber and a welder. Uh, so we haven't quite gone there yet, but I think that uh, you know clearly we. As we get there, more and more things will not just be improved in terms of decision making and reduction in terms of human error and bias, but we will also see more and more um, completely new products and services uh, that we haven't haven't seen before. And I think just this large crisis we've been through, um, I've been deeply engaged in um, the use of AI for the R and D in the creation of the vaccines and the way in which that has been approached in the last few years since COVID started, no one thought going into this that it could be done in that short period of time, mm -hmm. but it was. <laughs> so we know it could, can, yeah. it has been. And I think that, that kind of shows that when we figure out that of how, where that point is moved between man and machine integration, uh, we can accomplish things that we weren't able to accomplish. But, you know, it, it can go both ways, uh, obviously. Yeah. Well, and of course, I, I had very little doubt that we were going to run out of time today because we could obviously chat out here for, for hours. Um, but so I'm going to, so we have about 20 seconds each uh, to, to give, to leave our, our, our guests, our listeners with, with one tip, recommendation or suggestion. Um, with regards to this to this topic, um, uh, so Michael, back to you quickly. Fifteen to twenty seconds. You know, what is what is one tip or recommendation suggestion that you have? I'll do it to the CEO of boards. Own it. Don't delegate. Don't delegate. Mark, what about you? Uh, don't forget EQ, the human being. Sanjay. Uh, I would say be open to have technology drive your life and business. It's inevitable and use that as an opportunity versus threat. And you know, let's all be careful also at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I would agree that what I heard all, all three of you say, uh, be human and embrace embrace technology. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you so much. Uh, I look forward to, to chatting again soon. And uh, enjoy the rest of the, the harassers day here at the USA meeting. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.